Okay. All righty. Welcome, everyone. My name is Ken. I'm here with Ling So, and we've got another one of these Master Gardener classes with uh, Lisa and Kathleen. So I'm going to turn it over to them. Please feel free to um, send in your questions via chat, and then we'll go ahead and address them towards the end of the class. But without further ado, the floor is all yours. Okay. Hi. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Um, in the screen right now, in the middle of it, does it say this meeting's being recorded? Yes. Okay. I might have to stop sharing just for one second. Uh, it doesn't show for me, um, but it might be a nuisance on your side, I think. Okay. Yeah, only you can see that, Lisa. Only I can see it. Okay. I don't have a cursor because I'm in keynote. But anyway, um, I just want to welcome everybody. Thank you for showing up. We know that it's... Uh, a lot of people are zoomed out two years into the pandemic, but um, we really appreciate you coming. I'm a master gardener. My sister Kathleen is also a master gardener. And um, Kathleen has a degree in environmental horticulture from uh, City College in San Francisco. I have a degree in agricultural economics from Davis. And also I'm a master composter and Kathleen's an ISA certified arborist and a professional vegetable gardener and we uh and i'm her assistant with professional vegetable gardening so let's, Lisa i had a small farm for years yeah and i ran a small farm ah i'm so sorry that this is happening but it is not letting gosh darn it this happens every yeah. time um Lisa, if you want to just start over that's totally fine i don't have a cursor and i'm hitting escape so i cannot get out of here so, um, oh. Kathleen, do you mind putting up the PDF and sharing your screen? Sure. Okay. Sorry, uh, everybody. Um, ba -ba -dum. Hold on. Where is, here we go. I don't know why Keynote just absolutely never works for me. Huh. Okay. Okay. Sorry, everybody. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Is it there? Yep, it's there. So okay. you won't have my new screens, but my two new things, but um, okay. great. And you can go on to the next slide. So just want to thank everybody for coming. Um, and thank you for zooming in. All right, next slide. Um, and what we're going to cover today is the why, where, when, what, and how of um, uh, vegetable gardens and then a few other things if we have time at the end we'll go through a little seating demonstration um but this is why to grow vegetables okay kathleen so sorry about that okay um so why grow your own vegetables because there's so many farmers markets i should mention this is coming to you from northern california actually mid peninsula of Northern California. So when we get to planting charts and all that, it's gonna be for our area. And unfortunately, I just don't know other areas. So uh, just to kind of let you know, everything will be geared towards uh, peninsula gardening. Um, so why grow your own vegetables? I mean, the main reason I grow my own vegetables because they taste really, really good. <laughs> the difference between a home growing even broccoli, even things that you don't think could be that different from a farmer's market or a grocery store is so much better uh, from your garden. And so uh, the, the main reason I grow it is I, um, they taste good. And I, I honestly, I use my vegetable garden like a, um, like a grocery store. So almost every morning, I've got spinach right now. Um, I go for my son, my spoiled son. Um, I go and pick a bunch of spinach and I cook it up. In the morning, we make a spinach omelet. And so many of my meals, um, so many of my meals are just really straight out of the garden. Um, and the other reason, uh, next slide, and Kathleen, you can get into this a little bit, but um, the vegetables from your own garden are so much more 
um, nutrient dense than vegetables that you're getting from a grocery store. So um, the, the USDA did a study of fresh fruits and vegetables, and they found a significant decline in the nutrient value of them since 1940, which is when we started using commercial fertilizers or chemical fertilizers. So if you grow your own organically, you will have more of these minerals. Wow. Cool. Okay, next slide. Um, so that's the why, where to grow your veggies. Um, <laughs> I mean, this might be obvious to some people, but um, it's not obvious to everybody. So you really only need three things to be successful in a garden. Um, and that is sun, living soil, and water. So as long as you have plenty of sun, and that means at least six hours for a root vegetable, carrots, turnips, rutabaga, beets, um, at least six full hours. And for fruiting vegetables, which are really fruits, but um, you need at least eight hours. So, and when we say six, eight, six or eight hours, we mean go outside, <laughs> like, <laughs> and make sure the sun is hitting your skin, not dappled sun, not uh, you know, pure sun is, is upon you. Um, I can't tell you how many times Kathleen and I have gone to client's house and we say, you, we have to have minimum eight hours of sun. And they say, oh yeah, absolutely. I've got, it's pure sun, sun from the morning until the afternoon. And then we go and, um, and it's like under an oak tree or it's, you know, it's next to a redwood tree or next to their house or, and they have like four hours of sun and they're like, oh, huh, I, I, I thought for sure it was full sun. So <laughs> um, you just have to be honest with yourself. And I know sometimes that's hard. It's hard for me. Um, but <laughs> with the correct sun, you can avoid all the diseases and the heartache that, um, that, you know, if, the, if they're not getting enough sun, then you're going to have so many more pest problems and you're going to have fungus problems. And so you have to give the plant what the plant needs. And it's not a negotiation. It's not a like, if you grow here, I promise I'll be good. <laughs> um, it's, it's just, they need what they need, just like humans need what they need. Okay. Yeah. Pre pretend you're a solar panel when you go out and look, because essentially that's what a plant is. Lisa and I taught a class last month about bare root uh, fruit tree planting. And this woman tried to negotiate with us that she gets sun when the sun is between the two houses. And we're like, <laughs> you know, that's just not going to work. Yeah. We wish it were true, but that's how they eat. It's like us not eating. So, okay. Next slide. I think people get that. Um, and where, where to grow your stuff. So on the left-hand side is my current garden and it's all in raised beds. And on the right-hand side is my old garden and it's all in the ground. And I was just talking to Kathleen and Can before this class started. I think I'm gonna get rid of all my raised beds. Um, it's, you can't really see it in this slide. But what I find happening is from my raised beds, I, I let things go to seed because I, I like doing that. And so the seeds are falling all over the place. And when they land in the ground, they germinate, they grow. I can't tell you how many beets, lettuce, bok choy, pak choy, uh, chard I have growing right now not in my raised bed because the seeds just <laughs> fell to the ground and they all germinated. They all got watered at the right time. And honestly, I just, I think it's easier just to grow them in the ground. Now, if you have raised beds, you have raised beds and if you don't want to get rid of them, keep them. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of a believer in growing stuff in the ground and having roots in the ground. And we'll get into living soil in a little while. We'll get into cover cropping. Um, but there's so much good stuff 
in the earth, you know, kind of why not access it? And also it's free. I mean, building those raised beds. You'll use a lot less water, Lisa. Yeah. And that's the other thing you'll right now. It's a very good point. The stuff that all has all germinated on its own. When I dig around that soil, it's still moist. I've had to, because we haven't had rain in six weeks. I've had to go ahead and water my vegetable garden. So, you know, I don't know. I, I think it's just more economical. Now, the benefit of having a raised bed, you do have better control. So you can control, and we'll get into this a little bit later in the talk, but um, you can get control birds better. You can control rodents better. Um, it's maybe not better, but it's easier. Um, so you do have more control with a raised bed. But I had plenty of, I don't know, I don't know. My old garden was a farm and it was about a half an acre under cultivation. And I had so much food come out of that. I mean, I probably had oh, 500 pounds of food a week come out of that farm. So, you know, the rodents didn't get that much stuff. So I, don't I, know. I think if you have gophers is the number one reason why people do raised beds is then they put gopher wire on the bottom and up the sides. But honestly, if you look at <clears throat> how most of our food is grown, it, it's grown in the ground. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know why gophers didn't eat my stuff, but they didn't. I mean, I think I had as many gophers as other people had. But um, OK, next um next uh and this is still we're at where how much space do you need um so you know with california really we can grow year round so i always think of it in kind of three planting seasons and we're coming up like we're in one right now kind of february march april planting season and then um late summer and then fall where you're planting, you're planting your crops. Um, I would say for a family of four, about four raised beds, uh, if you're doing raised beds and same amount, if you're, if you're in the ground, if you decide to do in the ground, you know, do maybe two or three rows of 10 feet uh, would be enough for a family of four. And that, when I say enough, I mean, is that going to be your only, you know, you're still going to have to buy some stuff from the grocery store or farmer's market, but that would kind of take, if you eat seasonally, that would kind of take care of your vegetable needs, I would say. Uh, Kathleen, anything to add? I would say at least do three beds or three rows, just so you can rotate your crops through on a three-year rotation yeah yeah and we get we'll into get that into, a little bit. we'll get into that but it, it's just so much easier yeah yeah so three three whatever if it's rows or raised beds at a minimum and probably if you can fit four four is better and that's gorilla gardening so that middle one is my dad's house <laughs> and i i planted some artichokes there <laughs> so you know you got to be on the lookout if your neighbors aren't really using their property, you know, maybe you do a little <laughs> gorilla garden. <laughs> and if your neighbor has the same last name, it helps. <laughs> yeah. My dad didn't mind that so much. And, you know, you know, tons and tons of artichokes. That was, that was good. Uh, okay. Next slide. Um, the soil food web. So uh, where we were saying, um, at the beginning where to grow stuff we needed sun living soil and water so how do you get living soil um, and and kathleen will get into cover cropping a little bit of how to keep your soil alive but we think in terms um always i i never think in terms of feeding the plant i 100 percent think in terms of feeding the soil and so how do i keep my soil alive how do i keep uh, oxygen in it. Um, and for me, I don't use fertilizer. I just, well, I do, but it's in the form of compost. 
So I make my own compost. Um, and I, I luckily have access to a horse manure and I've got chickens. And so I have chicken manure and I, uh, and all my food scraps and all my trimmings. Um, so um, I feed my soil a lot of compost and I feed my soil three times a year with compost. Um, so between each crop, I was just talking, we'll get into that too, cropping and cropping patterns. And, uh, but between each planting out, I add more compost to my beds or to the ground. And if, if you're making your own compost, I probably add about two inches uh, three times a year, so six inches of compost. If you're buying compost, um, and also just disclosure, we do not work for Linkso, uh, but they happen to have some really, really good products. And one of them is their distal structured compost. And so um, that, uh, it's a little expensive. I'd probably put half an inch. Um, again, three times a year. And you can just go buy it by the bag. So it's pretty easy. You can then just uh, bring the bag to your garden. Um, and we'll get into soil management and cover cropping. Um, we don't use fertilizer. Now, if you know, I, I know plenty of gardeners who use organic fertilizer. Don't use, you know, don't use um, miracle Grow. That's like the equivalent of using Miracle Whip. Um, you know, that's not good for your soil. <laughs> that's going to kill your soil. So um, you don't want to use icky stuff. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, you do, but you want the poop to be from horses and chickens. You want the poop to be from a source you know. Yeah, yeah. Not um, petroleum. <laughs> okay, yeah, not petroleum. Okay, next slide. Uh, <clears throat> how do you feed the soil food web? Um, so a lot of it is you grow a diversity of plants. So you're all in the Kathleen talked a little bit about um, growing, uh, rotating your crops because different things, it's going to call in, your plant's going to call in different nutrients to your soil. Um, feed the soil compost, cover cropping, and mulch. Uh, keep your soil covered and cool, um, always. And I will say I'm doing a little bit of uh, landscaping at my house right now. About four years ago, I put about four inches of mulch all over my entire yard. And I had to move some of that soil uh, recently. When I moved in, it was hard pan. After four years of just being, I didn't do anything but put mulch on it. That's all I did. It was growing grasses and it had grasses. Um, and a bunch of grasses. And I tell you, it's like butter. I mean, my soil, it was just like, whew, it is so nice. So keep your soil covered. It's really, really important. And um, I'm going to tell the Megan story, Kathleen. Okay. Like, don't go, don't go out naked, you know, and don't let your soil be naked. So our niece, who had a baby yesterday, um, <laughs> When she was a little girl, she was like four years old going to nursery school. And she told her mom, um, I'm not going to wear clothes to school today. I'm going to go naked. And uh, so she got in the car naked in her little car seat and off they went to school. And uh, it came time to pop out of the car and go into school. And Megan said, hmm, I'm not sure if this was a good idea. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, Annie had some clothes with her knew that this might happen and uh, and Megan put some clothes on and went into school and had a fine day but um the point is don't we don't go around naked don't let your soil go around naked um you know there's a reason why we cover up <laughs> there's lots of reasons why we cover up but um make sure your soil's covered it's really important it's really important and I talked to the fire so I live in Portola Valley talk to the fire chief here because there's a lot of stuff going around the internet, you know, oh, don't use, you know, don't use mulch. Well, he said, it's totally fine. Uh, small mulch, two to three inches on the ground, not a fire hazard. Um, and the nice thing is it retains all the moisture into your soil. So you can use like 50% less water because you're retaining that moisture. 
that was a long that was a long talk about covering your soil um <laughs> and we don't your point well yes thank you uh we don't till uh, we're no-till farmers and we don't disturb our soil because the soil knows what's best for it the soil stratifies itself and the little fungi who want to be in the top quarter inch are there and the little fungi who want to be in the next quarter inch are there and same with all the life same with the worms same with everything so when you go and you turn that upside down it's like somebody taking your house and turning it upside down it's really disorienting to the all the life in the soil so please don't do that um if growing in raised beds fill them with lingso veggie again we don't work for lingso we're not affiliated with lingso but um lingso has a prog uh product called a uh, vegetable blend which has diesel structured compost and quarter minus fur bark and um and compost and um it's a really good product it's a really really good product you should say kathleen about your, your client yeah so. i had a client and um I filled, we did new beds and I filled them all with Lingso Veggie Blend. And she complained to me that it was too productive. <laughs> so that, that will be your biggest complaint if you use Veggie Blend. You'll have it, too much production. Yeah, they'll supercharge living, living soil. And we've gone into uh, putting compost on three times a year. Okay, next slide why feed the soil we probably have covered all of this but feeding the soil food web you increase your organic matter also i mean and if you want to go get a soil test a lot of people do um i can tell you what the soil test is going to say so i'll save you the hundred bucks it's going to say <laughs> add organic matter so how do you add organic matter you do it through roots through cover cropping chop and drop which we'll talk about and adding compost so it doesn't matter if your soil's too clay doesn't matter if it's too sand it's gonna your soil report i'm gonna guarantee you what it's gonna say it's gonna say add organic matter so um so anyway add organic and matter if you use a wood mulch you're adding organic matter as well the life in the soil will come up and pull that that carbon down into the soil and consume it yeah yum 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 and that's done by the little <laughs> fungi. guys. Um, you'll increase your water holding capacity, increase your infiltration. You might have seen soil where the water won't percolate in. Um, after you mulch and you add some compost, you're gonna you're gonna increase your infiltration, so you won't lose that the few precious drops we get. You won't lose; it'll actually go into your soil, and you improve your soil structure. Um, and the most important thing about feeding the soil food web is you will have very a very healthy plant that can fend for itself and thereby eliminating the need for any pesticides, herbicides, or fertilizers. And you also will have very nutritious vegetables. Okay. Tastes good. Yeah, better tasty. <laughs> um soil management. This is from Gabe Brown, who's a farmer in North Dakota. Uh, which Kathleen and I were born in North Dakota. Um, carbon is the key to recarbonize your soil. And is, so his five principles, which we follow is don't disturb your soil. Um, so don't till it, don't step on it. Um, step on paths, you know, have paths. Um, grow green living plants. So we'll get into cover cropping, but you should always have roots in the ground. Uh, grow a diversity of plants. Cover your soil with when at nauseum and to mulch, green mulch, which is cover cropping, um, and incorporate animals if you can. Not everybody can because depending on where you live, if you can have chickens and you know here it's hard to have ruminants. You know you can't really have cows and sheep and stuff. But um, the idea is that they come and eat your cover crops and they poop, and it's actually a really good. It's a good cycle to have. Um, and um, some things to Google and read, watch and listen and see. Uh, Google Wendy Silver. She um, did the Marin Carbon Project about recarbonizing the soil in Marin County. Read uh, Dirt to Soil by Gabe Brown. Um, if you haven't yet, watch Kiss the Ground. Uh, that's a good movie. It came out right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, it's a good movie. It's well done. Or another movie called Living Soil or Symphony of Soil. 
And uh, my daughter just reminded me of, um, what's that one, Kathleen, The Biggest Little Farm? Yeah. Biggest Little Farm. That's another, it's Apricot Lane is the name of the farm. And uh, that's another good movie to watch, especially if you're just kind of sitting around and need something to do. Um, listen to, and it's all women, I may say. Uh, but Dr. Chris Nichols, Dr. Christine Jones, and Christine Olson are three women uh, soil soil scientists and we've had the good fortune to go to some of the classes taught by these very groundbreaking women um you'll by the way you'll get these slides so you don't have to take notes uh can will send them out so um and then we went and saw this is before the pandemic but there's a no-till farm up in sebastian pool uh called singing frog farm and it's becoming more and more i mean more and more farmers are getting it. More and more farmers are doing good soil management. They're not tilling their soil anymore. And they're farmers, even where Kathleen and I are from in the Dakota, you know, they're kind of now looking over the fence and seeing their neighbor and seeing that, oh, they're not using pesticides and herbicides and they're not getting out there with their tractor to till. And so they have so much less input so much less cost going into it and they're making more money and they're growing more specialty crops instead of just growing corn and soy and in the Dakotas it's it's um, sunflowers but um, growing a diversity of, of crops so this is the way of the future this is the way to help global warming um, okay next slide I feel like I'm on a soap box Benefits of cover cropping. <laughs> Kathleen, you want to talk about cover cropping? Yeah, so a cover crop is essentially any plant that you're growing and you're not going to harvest. Any Anything in your vegetable garden you're growing and you're not going to harvest. I also cover crop around my fruit trees. Um, and it's just a variety of seeds that you throw down. Um, you cover them up a little bit, you water them. And when they are starting to flower, you chop them down. You leave the roots in the ground. And what it does is it sends carbon directly into your soil. Um, the plants through their photosynthesis create carbon and they've found that plants give at least a third of their energy to the soil um, biome to feed the soil because they get a benefit from it. So it's good stuff. And next month, if if you want to watch another Zoom, I'm doing a cover crop class for Linksos. Oh, good. I think good. it's next month. Yeah. All right. So if you want to know more about cover cropping, you can certainly Google it. Um, or I'm doing a class next month on it. All right. And next slide, I think, is cover cropping also. Um, and I cover crop, I, you can see the word vetch has been crossed out because I used to cover crop with um, legumes, annual rye. Uh, I, I do a lot of grass. I do oats. Um, I still do clover. I did have vetch in my mix, but I took vetch out because then vetch has like taken over my entire lot. So now I don't use vetch anymore. Yeah, um, vetch is too vigorous. Yeah, yeah. And Kathleen usually just puts either zero to one legume. Yeah. I probably do a little bit more on the legumes than you do. Yeah. Well, you know, and that was it Christy Nichols who told us you yeah. need eight different plant families and you don't need any legumes, that there's free living nitrogen fixing bacteria that you don't need to plant. See, a legume takes nitrogen from the atmosphere and it makes these little nodules on its roots. And then when you cut it down, it releases that nitrogen. But um, through Christine Nichols study, she's found that there's enough free living nitrogen fixing bacteria in the soil. You don't need to plant a legume. Yeah, I still do. Uh, I think they're pretty and- um, Yeah, I mean, I have, I have those crimson fava beans that I just yeah. let grow. That's, you know, I was just going to say that Kathleen gave me some seeds to these uh, fava beans with a purple flower instead of a white flower. They're so pretty. And what I do is I actually don't chop and drop them yeah. uh, with a lot of a lot of cover crops. What you do is then you take your pruners and you chop them from the tops all the way down 
and you just let that fall onto the ground and that becomes your mulch and feeds your further feeds your soil. But with those with the, um, you could do the same thing with a bell bean or a fava bean, but I just let them go to seed and then the little seeds just fall onto the ground and then the new ones come up the next year. It's just a super a lazy way to cover crop. And, um, and it looks so pretty right now because they're all blooming. Yeah, um, same in and, my yard. Yeah. And they know when to do it. You know, the other nice thing is my garden's a self-service garden. <laughs> it, it knows to do what it's supposed to do when it's supposed to do it. Yeah. You plant it. You seed arugula once. Yeah, that's exactly. Exactly. All right. Uh, next, uh, next uh, slide. Uh, water. Okay. So now we're into, we did the sun, the soil, the water. Um, Drip irrigation. So in my garden, I use uh, drip irrigation. I use inline admitter. That's T tape in the upper left, which is fine. Um, uh, so um, drip irrigation with inline admitters. I don't loop my system. I just have straight lines. Whether I was in the ground or in my raised bed, it's the same thing. Didn't loop. I have it set, um, well, now it's turned off. So now I'm hand watering um, when it was turned on during the summer. Um, I water in the morning. For veggies and raised beds, you're gonna probably have to do it depending on the weather and the wind and the sun a couple times a week. Um, if it's in the ground, maybe a little less. If it's super hot or super windy, a little more, three times a week. Um, long, Lisa? I do mine about a half an hour. Yeah. How about you, Kathleen? Yeah, probably 20 minutes, okay. but I'm in the ground. Yeah. So in the ground, you just have to water a little less. Um, okay. Next slide. When, okay. When do you garden? It's so good. You guys are here because February, <laughs> um, this is the time you garden. Um, so we talked about the three seasons. Um, basically you take December and January off from gardening. It's like nothing to do. Same thing kind of like in July, not a lot to do, but we're going right into now the like time where you are getting going on it. So February is the time where you can plant all your spring. So this is a spring and summer class where you plant all your spring planted brassicas. We'll get into what, what brassicas are. Um, so this is the time you start, I have my little chart here, but arugula, beets, broccoli, cabbage, uh, cauliflower, chard, cilantro, collards, fennel, kale, kohlrabi, lettuce, uh, mustard greens, parsley, on and on. This is the time. It's ready, set, go time. Um, what do you do before you go out there with your trays of plants or your seeds? is you wanna make sure that you have amended your soil, put some of that compost on top. You don't have to work it in. If you wanna work it in a little bit, you can. Work it into the first inch or two, you can. Um, but it's, it's go time right now. Um, when growing spring planted, um, and you have to think about space. So I'll plant my whole garden out now with all my spring wonderful brassicas and greens. Um, but I am thinking, because I know in the end of April, I'm going to be planting my eggplant, my tomatoes, my peppers. And before that, I'm going to be planting my beans, my squash. Um, so you just have to get a plan in your head of where you want what and what you can interplant. So, um, so you're just always thinking, because you live in California, um, if you do live in California, thank your lucky stars, but you can grow food year round. And that means you have to kind of tuck things in and uh, make it all work in the space you have. Um, only other thing I want to add to that is at the end of the tomato season. So when you're taking your tomatoes out, let's say that's um, October or so, um, you want to follow that with broccoli. Um, so you don't get a disease called verticillium, and we'll get into that in, in, a, in a minute. Um, also, I want to say your, your spring planted things are the exact same things you're also going to be planting in fall. 
in August, September, October, which is considered fall in a garden. Um, but your spring, my spring planted kale can go for a year or sometimes two years. My fall planted kale and my fall planted broccoli, um, it bolts right away. I mean, I, I can, I, I get a crop out of it, but it, is it called vernalization, Kathleen? Yeah. So it, right when it gets too cold for it, um, it, it bolts. Bolting means it puts up a seed head. So I get a much shorter season from my August, September, October planted kale than I do from my February, March planted kale. So, and that's just, observe, you know, that's just, I just noticed it over the years. And um, like, I really like marathon broccoli. I like spring planted marathon broccoli because then I can have broccoli. I have broccoli all spring and all summer and sometimes into fall from my spring planted broccoli. So um, anyway, just think of that because those, those broccoli plants and those kale plants are gonna be in there a long, long time. So think about your space and where you're going to be you putting your tomatoes and things. If that bed is full of broccoli and you know it's going to go all the way to October. Um, so, okay. All right, Kathleen. Oh, there's my, <laughs> this is what I'm looking at over here on my wall. This is my planting chart. So this is from the Master Gardener Santa Clara County. So you can just go to mgsantaclara.com. Um, ucanr.edu and you'll get you'll get that link um and this is everything i was just reading off um right now it's february so january you don't do anything december you don't do anything you can see kind of that blue and red column but right now you are getting a lot of stuff in the ground in february march um sneaking a little bit into april but then come april may that's when you're getting all your tomatoes and your summer squash and your peppers and your eggplant. Um, so that's when you're getting all your summer stuff. So you'll see things kind of grouped up. So you'll see the, um, let's take arugula. You know, you can plant it now, February, March, and then you plant it again, September, October. So all your spring stuff is the exact same as all your fall stuff. And then in the middle, those May, June months, that's where all your summer stuff is. So that's where you're gonna see your tomatoes, your sweet potatoes, your winter squash, which grows in the summer, even though it's called winter squash, your summer squash, which is also grown in the summer, um, your peppers, your okra, your melons, um, eggplant, cucumbers, that's all your summer stuff, uh, basil. And uh, the rest is all your spring and fall stuff. Um, so this is a great chart. Kathleen and I have, um, we've used a lot of charts in our days. And this is my favorite chart. By, and it's nice. It, it says transplant what cannot be direct seeded. Yeah. So this gives you so much information. Um, we'll get into that a little bit of what's direct sowed and what you have to start in flats. But um, this just gives you a ton of information of when you need to direct, you know, when you can direct sow things and love, love this chart. Okay, Kathleen, next. Um, this is Pam Pierce's chart. So if you live in, in San Francisco uh, or a colder, a little bit colder climate, um, instead of using the Santa Clara County chart, you could use this chart. It's in, I have the book right here. Maybe I'll grab the book. This is Not Pam Pierce. Not different though. Yeah, it's not, it's not going to be that different. Um, but I will say, sorry to like look at my belly button. Um, this is Pam Pierce's book, Golden Gate Gardening. And there's Pam on the back. Um, this is probably my favorite, um, especially when I was a beginner gardener. I reference this book all the time. And um, this is going to be in the show notes. <laughs> um, so. It's a great book, and Kathleen and I were lucky enough when Pam was still teaching at City College. Um, she was the foundation of all my vegetable knowledge, and she's a phenomenal gardener. She writes for the San Francisco Chronicle too, so you'll read her. You'll read her stuff. In, I think it's called Golden Gate Gardening uh, for, in the Cron. Um, okay, next. 
Okay, what, what to plant, warm versus cool. So we kind of covered this a little bit, but one thing I want to point out is your warm season stuff, which is your Solancia family, your tomatoes, potatoes, eggplant, pepper, tomatillos. Uh, your cucumbers, which are all your, your melons and squashes and cucumbers, corn, which is a grass. And then your, your summer legume is beans and your winter legume is peas. Um, but you notice the warm stuff grows best from 65 to 85. And your cool stuff, which is what you're planting right now, those brassicas, the amaranthiaceae, asteraceae, um, those you're putting in the ground right now. And they like it 55 to 75. So you will see the overlap there um, from 65 to 75 that warm stuff, you know, cool stuff can tolerate it and warm stuff can tolerate just that, that middle zone there. Um, once it gets over 85 for your hot stuff, it just, the, the plants just kind of uh, shut down. And if it's too cold, um, a lot of the brassicas can take, they can take a frost um, and they actually get sweeter, like a kale and stuff will get sweeter with a frost, but that's, uh, that's their happy place is um, 55. Um, and uh, this is, I like this chart. I made this chart myself, but I like it because it, it breaks things down to family. So you can really see what your summer families are and what your spring and fall families are. Anything to add, Kathleen? Um, just that it's important to, to notice what families your vegetables are in. So when you rotate your crops, right. you, you don't move a tomato where your eggplant was or where your peppers were. Yeah, good They're point. The same family. Yeah, so when we talk about rotating crops, which we will talk about, it's rotating by family. Um, and again, you wouldn't, you wouldn't back up beets with spinach because they get a leaf miner and then it's just gonna go from your beets to your spinach. So it's, um, you're gonna wanna, and that's why we said have three beds because you're gonna wanna change out your families in each of those beds. Now that is a little hard with the brassica family because almost everything that you're growing, not everything, but a lot of what you're growing in spring and fall is in the brassica family, your arugula, bok choy, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, you know, everything that we think of as a vegetable. And a vegetable is you're eating the vegetative part of the, you're eating the leaf of a plant is, or the vegetative part of a plant. And that's why it's called a vegetable. <laughs> like my daughter, who's a vegetarian who doesn't eat any vegetables. <laughs> Uh, it contains the vegetables, the vegetative matter. <laughs> <laughs> She's good there. She's got lots of vegetables. <laughs> okay, uh, next slide. Um, how? How to plant? Um, so that's my little garden basket. I actually have it behind me. And <laughs> that's all I have. That's, that's it. Um, I've got my soil knife. I've got my hand pruners. I've got a sharpener for my hand pruners and I have a little saw. I don't really wear my gloves um, every once in a while I do, but not, not very often. Um, I'm not going to show you how to sharpen your hand pruners right now, but, um, but they should be nice and sharp. Uh, and I use a diamond. Kathleen always gives it to me. Thank you, Kathleen. Uh, for the DMT sharpener to keep my pruning chair sharp. Um, and then how to plant a plant. All you do, yeah, maybe I'm going to grab my soil knife. Hang on just one second. Sorry, I should have thought of this ahead of time. But you just put your soil knife in the soil, you pull it back, you pop in your six pack and pat it in a little bit and you're done. I mean, that's how you plant a plant. Um, you plant perennials, like let's say you're planting a fruit tree. Um, you plant perennials high, you plant annuals low. So um, like a tomato, if you get a tomato from the nursery, you can pinch off those bottom leaves and you can bury the stem like six inches. You can bury it more than six inches. So 
uh, no problem with planting a annual low. If you're planting a perennial, a shrub or a, a tree or um, plant it high up so the water can shed away from it. So, okay, Kathleen, next, uh, next slide. Uh, how, seeds and starts. Um, so it just depends on your time and your interest and everything else. You can just go to your local nursery and buy right now six packs of lettuce and broccoli and kale and cabbage and cauliflower and, um, uh, and just plant the little seedlings out and that's fine. And if you're gonna plant seedlings, just make sure what I would do is make sure they're as tall as they are wide so they haven't been stressed. Like right now they should be in pretty good shape because it's they should all be brand new right now. They should all be about six weeks old. Um, you can pop them out of the little six pack, look at the roots, make sure the roots aren't all wound up and all root bound. Um, and I like Half Moon Bay Nursery. Um, Kathleen lives in Santa Cruz. She uses San Lorenzo hardware um, in nursery. Um, but any, any local nursery is fine. Um, the other thing, if, if we have enough time at the end of the talk today is I'm gonna show you just a little seeding demonstration of how to seed tomatoes. Um, what else, Kathleen, what am I missing? Just because the nursery has um, plants doesn't mean it's time to plant them. Like yeah. you'll see tomatoes in nurseries probably the end of March. No, before that. But it's too early to plant tomatoes. So look at the chart and plant according to the chart, not according to what the nursery has. Yeah. Yeah. Just follow the chart and you'll be okay. Yeah. All right. Next slide. Uh, sewing requirements. So um, what must be direct sewed, we'll, we'll go over that in a second. You can do either or must be sewn in flats. So this is if you're gonna be seeding yourself and you're not buying little seedlings. So direct sew means that you put it um, right into your garden bed, uh, whether the it's a raised, seeds. pardon me? The seeds right into the ground. Right, right. So you just take your seed package and you can just sprinkle it or if it's, um, Oh, uh, for like all seed. you can see that everything over there is a root crop. Yep, everything. So everything that must be direct sowed, um, you're there are things that are roots because you can't transplant. Well, I mean you can, if you have nothing but time on your hands, um, you could transplant carrots. Yeah, but it's really hard to do it correctly. Yeah, and you're gonna get a weird carrot that's all. Yeah misshapen and so just direct so super super easy you just go buy a seed package uh, this is tomato but you just go buy a seed package sprinkle it on um, cover it with a little bit of compost water it in uh, done other than you need to keep like carrots you need to keep what keep the soil moist for about 21 days for them to to germinate but other things are going to pop right up like a radish I like to seed carrots and radishes together to just kind of remind me to keep that soil moist. Radishes pop up in a day or two. They germinate right away and they pop right up. Um, so those I like to seed together. Um, so either you can direct sow or flats, lettuce, arugula, kale. You know, so many of those, it's just so much easier to direct sow. Them. So yeah. Especially arug like arugula. I mean, I would never buy a six pack of arugula. Yeah or even lettuce for that matter. Yeah, I mean, or fava beans. I mean, that's ridiculous. Or peas. Yeah. I mean, you can't, we're not, you know, we're not calling you ridiculous if you do, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't need to. And it's, if you buy a seed pack, you get a lot more than you get in a six pack. And they just, yeah. they'll come up so quickly. You don't need to do it yeah. inside in flats. And also a seed pack is a couple of dollars, you know, three dollars or so it's just a lot more affordable so and you get more interesting plants yeah yeah exactly um so and then what must be sown so the kind of the more prima donna ish is um 
broccoli, cauliflower, cabbage, uh, Brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, those must be started if you're going from seed and not seedlings, those must be started in flats and then put out into your garden. Now, um, basil, eggplant, peppers, tomatoes, you seed those now, you, even though they're not gonna be planted until May, um, you go ahead and seed them at the end of February and then you can plant them out end of April, beginning of May. So, uh, okay, next slide. Oh, how do you prepare your bed? <laughs> um, one thing I do wanna say is have everything on hand. Like don't go buy your seedlings um, if you don't have your compost and your mulch and everything on hand because the temptation, and I've done it plenty of times, the temptation is gonna be just to go ahead and plant that and don't do your compost and don't do your mulching. Um, so I understand that temptation and I've done it plenty of times. So um, you have your little plants in the upper left and you have your um, compost and your mulch. For me, I, I do make my own compost and the mulch is actually from, um, it's, it's horse bedding is what I use for mulch in my, uh, in my vegetable beds. Uh, I have my area ready to plant in my bed. I put down my compost, put down some mulch. I lay out my plants. I do my little thing with my soil knife where I put my soil knife in, doop, doop, pop my plant in, and then I water it, I water it in. So it's warm, it's gonna be warm the next couple of days. It's gonna be like in the seventies. Um, it's nice actually to plant on a cloudy day um, rather than a super sunny day, <coughs> excuse me, just to get those guys a little, um, so they're not just blasted by the sun. It's gonna start cooling in, maybe in a, like four or five days, it's gonna cool down a little bit. Uh, so that might be a nice time to go ahead and plant out your garden. And in the meantime, you can get your compost and get your mulch and, um, and so you're totally ready to go. Um, okay, Kathleen, anything to add to that? Um, I would just say before you put down your compost and your mulch, it's, it's a good idea to pull up your irrigation line Oh, so it doesn't get buried because if you keep doing it without pulling up your irrigation line, eventually your irrigation is going to be so buried it's hard to pull it up. Yeah. And it's then when I pull up the irrigation line, then I put my little plants right at an emitter so I know they're getting water. Yeah, that's that's a smart, uh, smart way to go. All right. Uh, direct sowing root vegetables. Um, We'll just go through this quickly, but sow seeds one per square inch, cover with a little bit of compost. <laughs> um, don't let the surface dry out. So keep that, keep it cool. You know, a lot of times I put, it's called floating row cover, what you see in the bottom right. Um, I put floating row cover sometimes when I seed a bed and then I just water the floating row cover and that helps seal in that moisture. Um, uh, thinning. Um, so if you, um, let's say you do direct sow arugula or, or any, any green or any kale, if you want to thin, so you end up with just one plant per, let's say six inches or for broccoli, more than that, um, then you can just cut those little, just cut the tops off and you can eat those. They're delicious. You know, just pop them in your salad or whatever, use them for garnish. Um, okay, next. Plant spacing, uh, I'm gonna, uh, you guys will get this chart. So next, uh, transplanting, uh, nothing to say. I, say I give larger brassicas more than a foot. Yeah, I do too. I was gonna change this slide. I give my, I give my broccoli probably 18 inches. If I do it in the ground, sometimes I give it two feet. Um, yeah. cause it, and same with cauliflower, because it can get really big. Yeah. Um, my tomatoes, I give them like four feet. Yeah. Which I know that sounds like a lot, but if you're not going to prune them, if you're going to prune them and keep them like on a single stake, you can plant them pretty close together. But if you're going to let them, 
go or do light pruning on them, uh, they need they need room. They need space. So I put, let's say, in an eight foot bed, I'd put three tomatoes. In a ten foot bed, I'd put four tomatoes, um, and I'd do it in a zigzag pattern. Um, okay. Yeah, I agree. All right. Uh, protection bugs, blights, and birds. <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, a good source is looking up, um, if you put in IPM, which stands for integrated pest management into your search engine and University of California, um, you'll get some good methods on how to control things. You might've noticed when I was saying, um, on my slide that says preparing the beds, um, my husband made these things that go over. I do find in spring, um, when you plant those tender little brassicas, those tender little broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and kale, the birds just love them. Um, so you do have to, you either have to put a floating row cover over, or you have to, um, you have to protect them somehow. Um, Kathleen, what do you do with yours? I do a floating row cover. Floating row cover. Okay. So just something to, uh, to protect them. And just for a couple of weeks, maybe three weeks at the most. Yeah. Once they get big, they can defend themselves and they're fine. Um, and this slide, I think I got a little ahead of myself. This slide's a little bit more on bringing in good guys, bringing in good um, bugs, like planting a hedgerow. Or if, you're, if your vegetable garden's in the middle of your other garden, if you have some natives in your garden, bringing in some good bugs and the good bugs will eat the bad bugs and and there's not very many bad bugs there's um i can't remember is it like 98 percent of bugs are good um and just a few of them are cause a little damage and you know eh, it's kind of like so what um <laughs> <laughs> you know if it's a little damage cut if you have a leaf miner in one of your in your spinach or your chard or your beet greens you know just cut it out and don't eat it um, although there's plenty of cultures that would just eat it. So aphids, same thing. I just wash them off and then I eat it. Um, and especially with aphids, I find that aphids don't become a problem until my plants are almost finished anyway. Yeah, it's really the bugs come in when your plant's about to give up the ghost. Um, it's putting out pheromones saying, I'm about to die. Here's your opportunity come and eat me. And then that's when all the bugs come in and eat. Uh, so really during the growing season, you don't, you don't really have a big, a big problem with it. Yeah. As, uh, as long as you're not overwatering and you have healthy soil. Yeah. And you have enough sun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Sluggo, I do put out Sluggo. It is certified organic. Um, in spring, if it's moist, we, don't, we haven't had any moisture, but, um, yeah, uh, you can get slugs. You can get uh, slugs and snails, and I I will put out sluggo when I first plant. But again, it's just like once that plant gets like that big, it can take care of itself. It doesn't. Uh, you don't really need to then have it covered, and you don't need to have the sluggo out. It'll yeah. it'll fend for itself just fine. It can tolerate the damage. Yeah. Whereas when it's little tiny, it can't. Yeah. Uh, okay, I think we're talking about vertebrates. Oh, oh, I thought we were going to talk about something else. Okay, um, so what Kathleen and I saw a lot this past summer in tomatoes, we saw some verticillium wilt, uh, which that's Kathleen's hand on the far left. <laughs> and uh, we did a cross cut of the verticillium. And that's what it looks like. And it's, it's, um, it goes up the tissue. Yeah, thank you, Kathleen. Um, and it, it kind of strangles the plant. So then the water uh, can't move up and down. Um, how you recognize it, that second pit photo is, you'll get like a yellow V on your, on your leaf. And that's a sign that you have verticillium. Uh, at that point, I would probably take that plant out. Um, and unfortunately, here's the bad news. Uh, the verticillium goes into your soil and it stays there for a long time. 
it stays there for like 27 years or something. Um, that's why you really want to rotate your crops. You don't want to plant tomatoes in the same place year after year after year. Um, it's also why you want to follow tomatoes with broccoli. Uh, there was research done by UC Davis that broccoli and just broccoli, not just any brassica, um, will help keep the verticillium load down in your soil. So after you take your tomatoes out, whenever that is, October-ish, go ahead and plant broccoli. Um, if you have to plant your tomatoes in the same place year after year, because that's the only sunny spot you have. Um, definitely plant broccoli. Yeah, definitely plant broccoli and just take as good care of your soil as you can. Um, you might consider buying resistant tomatoes. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, there are tomatoes that are resistant. They're like VFSM or something, but they're verticillium by by cerium. Anyway, they're resistant. Yeah, they're resistant. Cerium and nematodes. 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 So they're resistant. They're not proof, but they're resistant to verticillium. So if you know you have a problem and you know you have it in your soil, you know, it's a real bummer. Um, and it, it, it attacks the Soliensia family, but it has a pretty wide range because yeah. even Acer, uh, it attacks the maple family. It, um, so it's a real bummer. Um, so be careful, take good care of your soil. Uh, one thing we saw last year, which we had never seen before was the tomato russet mite. And we saw how many clients had it? Oh. Um, two. Two clients, okay. But they had it bad. Yeah, so it's a silvering. If you see like a silvering of your leaves and they look a little metallic looking, you probably have a tomato russet mite. Um, Kathleen, I can't remember what the control you was. Cut off the leaves. Okay, just cut off the leaves. Cut off the affected leaves and, and then try to go up one more level of leaves because they're probably infected. They're just not showing it yet. Yeah, okay. Um, I think you could spray horticultural oil, but it's on the underside of the leaf. So it's pretty hard to, to get them covered and killed. And it's an annual. I don't. I don't really spray tomatoes because if they're not doing well, they're not going to perk up in time. And um, I just keep in mind that this is something to watch out for. Yeah. And so just on it when I see it. Yeah. Keep, keep an eye. I mean, um, oh, we'll get to a slide on observation. But I mean, a big, big part of gardening is see what you're looking at, uh, you know, really, really observe, really look at your plants and see what's going on. And they'll, you know, they will tell you if they're happy or not. So, um, okay. Um, next slide, please. Wind. So this is new for me. Um, I moved to a new house four years ago. I never had wind at my old garden. And now I'm trying to figure out how to garden in wind. And uh, almost everything I, um, I think I'm gonna be putting up some permanent wind breaks. And I'm also gonna go into the ground instead of in raised beds, cause then I'll be closer to the ground and it'll be a little easier for me to control. But um, probably somebody out there knows how to garden in wind way more than I do. But I find my plants are being stunted. And um, so, Wind is, it's a, it's a tough one. Um, okay. Uh, all right, Kathleen, next slide. Uh, how to prune a tomato. Um, so just at the apex, um, so where the, the main stem and the other stem, there are gonna be these little tiny succulent little growth coming out. And you just, just with your fingers, you don't need pruners or anything. You just, just take those off, just pinch those off. And then you'll have one main leader going up a pole. If that's how you want to grow it, if you want to grow it on a pole, some people grow it in cages. I do both. I grow some in poles and some on cages. Uh, if you're just doing a single leader, you can almost wind it up that pole, but you really have to keep on it. You really have to keep pinching back. Otherwise it's gonna branch off and you're gonna get another leader and then you're gonna get another leader. And then by the time, then you've got like 20 leaders and it just gets out of hand really quickly. Um, 
and I just put here, you can go to YouTube and see how to prune tomatoes. I think there's a lot of really good, there's a lot of good information out there, but yeah. it, it's amazing how much you can kind of see for me after I pruned one, how much stuff ends up on the ground. I mean, you're taking off a lot of growth when you're pruning a tomato. Uh, okay, next. Oh, my cat. <laughs> I love um, that slide. <laughs> that's Zazo, my cat. Um, <laughs> um, so I think these slides are a little bit, I thought this was going to be somewhere else in the presentation, but protection from birds, insects, and rodents. So we talked about sluggo. That's um, that little cover over my bed is what my husband made. And it keeps the birds out. It keeps rats out. It keeps squirrels out. Uh, so it's pretty good. It's pretty handy. Uh, we have a client lower left and they built um, more permanent, like an A-frame, which is nice. It's easy to use, uh, like it, it's a good system. And then in my old garden where it was all in the ground and it was rows, um, the nice thing is all, every single row is 25 feet. So I could just cut all my floating row cover to 25 feet. And um, that's kind of the method you use, Kathleen. Yeah. Okay. And then um, at Singing Frog Farm, when we went to tour that, they use tulle, which is like, um, like bridal veil material. And I just went to like Joanne's Fabrics and bought a whole bunch of tulle. And the nice thing about that, it's readily available. It's inexpensive. And you can see through it, which I kind of like. Um, so you can just water it and that keeps birds off. Now a rat's going to eat right through that. It's not going to keep a rat out um, or a squirrel for that matter. But um, yeah, but a rat's going to eat through this too. Yeah. The only thing a rat's not going to eat through is that the metal. Yeah. So, uh, okay. Next uh, uh, rodent control. So this is not actually my favorite subject, but um if you go to link, so I think there, if you look, I think there's some stuff uh, like a presentation on, on rodent control. Um, I have a problem with squirrels because my orchard and my vegetable garden are right next to each other. And um, it's really hard. The squirrels want to eat all my fruit. Um, so I did put out traps this past year. I didn't catch anything. Thank God. Um, and <laughs> what would I do if I caught it? I have no idea. <laughs> so, um, and then cinch traps for gophers. And I don't know, I, uh, my orchard is full of paperweight narcissus and I don't, they, gophers don't like those bulbs. So I don't know. I just haven't had a gopher problem. Do you have a gopher problem where you're at Kathleen? No, I don't. Okay. I don't know what to tell you, but I know people, you know, there are people certainly with gopher problems and I know they use cinch traps and I haven't had to use them. I have so. more of a rodent problem. And um, so I went to the office depot, or whatever, and I bought little boxes uh -huh. and I cut holes in two of the ends going through. Yeah. And I put uh, mouse traps in there. Okay. And I closed it up because the client has do uh, little dogs and cats. Yeah. And I didn't want them to get caught in a mouse trap. Yeah. But I trapped like a dozen little mice. Wow. Yeah. Wow. But that's, uh, that's very impressive. Yeah. And then you can just throw the whole box away because it's gross. Yeah. Or I guess you could compost the little bodies. Yeah. You know, like they do in Australia, they compost kangaroo. <laughs> <laughs> that was a talk Lisa and I went to about compost. <laughs> she did a cross section of her compost pile. There were like seven kangaroos in her compost pile. I'm sorry, I should not laugh, but it was funny at the time. Oh my God. It was a little out of nowhere, Lisa. <laughs> Well, because you were just talking about the little mice bodies. Yeah, I know. They can go into your compost pile. I mean, yeah, they can. Okay. All right. Um, next, uh, next slide. I'm just uh, talking about dead kangaroos. Um, harvesting. Um, so this is just the least fun part of gardening. <laughs> yeah. You know, maybe it's a certain personality who likes it. I don't know. But uh, my point 
with harvesting is it takes a lot of time. So you feel like, oh, I've planted all these, you know, gee, planting was so much fun and watching them grow and tending them was so much fun. And then it comes to harvesting. It takes a lot of time, especially like peas and beans and because you have to be harvesting those all the time to get production, to keep production up. You have to be harvesting all the time. And there's like, yeah, asparagus is the same. Cucumbers, tomatoes, um, eggplant. You have to harvest, harvest, harvest all the time, all the time. Cucumbers. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, the single serving items like a cauliflower, uh, that's kind of a one and done. So, however, I always keep my roots in the ground. So I'll cut that off at soil level. I'll bring in my cauliflower. And sometimes yeah. you, you will get a sprout off of that and you'll get another tiny cauliflower. Um, my cabbages, I can't tell you how many times, cut my cabbage off, bring my cabbage inside. And then I go out there and there's like seven little cabbages, you know, off of that stem. So, um, but, so, but the, the thing with harvesting is, just make sure you fit it into your schedule or fit it into your mind like okay I'm planting 25 bean plants do you know how much time it's going to take or, <laughs> <laughs> or cherry tomatoes they're the worst oh those little tiny mini tomatoes like the millionaire oh yeah. that'd be crazy <laughs> so sun gold I'm now down to I'll only allow myself two cherry tomatoes like a sun gold and maybe um a chocolate cherry or something because or a sweet 100 probably um because it takes so much time and you have to be out there all the time just harvest 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 I I feel like I'm complaining I mean <laughs> and it's delicious I'm not you know it's, then you eat it and it's delicious but it's just um, time consuming. Uh, let's see, know when to take your crop out, when something's gone to seed. Now, sometimes I'll just let my stuff go to seed and reseed itself, uh, like arugula is a good example of that. I did that with beets this year. I did that with lettuce this year. Carrots? Uh, carrots, I haven't you can done. let a couple carrots go to seed. They're beautiful. Yeah, they're pretty, and they're good for bees. Yeah. They're good for a lot of stuff. Um, Successive sowing, so the stuff that is kind of one and done, like your cauliflowers, your beets. Um, what you could do is like plant one cauliflower now. In two weeks, plant another cauliflower. In two weeks, plant another cauliflower. In two weeks, plant another cauliflower. You have like an eight week window, so you could get, you know, four or five cauliflower or beets is easy because you're just seeding it. So I seed, let's say six beets, and then I seed another six beets a week later, and then another six beets. But that way you don't have them all at the same time. And I've done that, I've made that mistake where you have 25 cauliflower all ready at the same time. What are you gonna do? I mean, you have to give it all away. And broccoli, it's not a one and done. You cut that main head and then you're gonna get side sprouts. So, um, so just know your vegetables, no single serving vegetables and know which ones you have to harvest to have them keep producing. If you don't harvest your beans and your peas, they're gonna say, oh, they're not eating me. I'm gonna go to seed and I'm gonna stop producing. So um, you just have to know what you have to keep on top of. And also cucumbers, like this is a bad example. Those are lemon cucumbers in the upper right. Um, I've renamed my lemon cucumbers into lime cucumbers because they're so much tastier when they're small and green than when they're big and yellow. So um, cucumbers get bitter if you don't if you don't harvest them. So you've got to keep on it. You just got to keep on it. Um, and it's it's kind of nice to plant a cucumber end of April and then again early June yeah. because cucumbers and zucchinis both kind of peter out yeah and they get like powdery mildew and and then if you do a successive sowing of them you'll keep your harvest going into the winter yeah and that's actually true even with beans like i'll do maybe a you know i'll do six beans but they kind of they go for a couple of months and then they kind of peter out too um so um 
bush beans peter out a lot sooner than uh, a vine than a, a vine bean. vining bean um, a pole bean pole bean yeah, thank you um so um and you know a lot of this is just learning and observation and looking and seeing oh wow that bush bean only gave me beans for too much but my pole bean's still producing so i'm only going to do pole beans or you know i i like bush beans personally because they're easy but um okay next slide uh general gardening tips so <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to save you $100 again. <laughs> Lisa saved you 200 bucks today. <laughs> ching, ching. Um, <laughs> so what we have found, so we do quite a bit of garden consultation where we just go and talk. So nice. <laughs> and what we see over and over again is people's gardeners or maybe even people themselves blowing their soil with a blower and making their soil like rock hard. So don't do that. That's bad. Um, <laughs> leave your leaves, leave your leaves in place. When things drop, leave them. Don't pick them up. And if you can't stand the look of that because it's, it's not a tidy look, you can rake them up, but put down mulch. Don't just let the earth be bare. Yeah. And you're going to get, it's going to be like cement. I can guarantee your soil is going to be horrible if you keep blowing it and if you don't cover it up. So now you don't have to hire Kathleen to come out to your garden <laughs> and pay her $100 to tell you that. For deciduous trees, the leaves drop and give the, the tree 98% of its needed nutrients just in those leaves. So it's like the tree is fertilizing itself if you leave the leaves in place. Yeah. So it's like this. They make the leaves. They drop the leaves. They feed the soil. They make the leaves. It's a, yeah. It's a closed cycle. Closed cycle. There you go. Uh, February. I always call this my national weeding month. We um, miss this part. What? Have a professional arborist. Oh, uh, okay. Um. Yeah, and this is right now, maybe a lot of you have done this already, but prune your fruit trees. Um, unless you really know what you're doing, I would hire an arborist to prune your fruit trees because we've seen so many bad cuts on trees and then the tree struggles. Um, so and a real yeah. arborist, not a guy in a pickup with a chainsaw. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> a real ISA certified arborist. Um, I have one working today. Oh, you do? Yep. Okay, nice. They're up and in you're... my eucalyptus right now. Oh, wow. Wow. Um, okay, we went through no naked soil, uh, weeding your garden. Um, like right now, popweed. I don't know if you guys know popweed, that weed with it's like a skinny seed. And when you pull it, it literally pops like popcorn. Um, that weed I do pull. Other weeds, I just cut off the tops. I just get my hula hoe out and I just cut off the tops. This is places where you don't want vegetation, like in a path or something, but you know, you do want roots in the ground. So um, if it's a weed that's growing there, that means a plant could grow there. So you could actually plant a plant there. Um, also, I do spray with vinegar. If it's like in a path, um, I'll spray it with vinegar. Um, okay, next slide. Oh, that's me. Um, <laughs> that's me from a long time ago with a great big, huge cauliflower. And then that's more recent, some things that I'm taking out of my garden right now. Some broccoli and sugar snap peas and some beets. And um, okay, we already said this, but use your garden like a refrigerator. Uh, oh, <laughs> then just some things that I'm eating out of the garden right now, which are delicious. Um, and next slide, Kathleen. Question. Okay. Um, can, can you feed us some questions? Absolutely. I've got quite a bit here. So let me go back to the start. Okay. So, um, this person lives on a third floor condo with a west and northwest facing balcony and they get afternoon sun. They'd like suggestions on which 
vegetables would likely grow well in this type of location. So west and northwest facing sun. I That's a little tough. Um, and it's probably probably only, only afternoon sun. So maybe probably three, four hours, I, I'm guessing. Yeah. Maybe leafy greens, like yeah. lettuce. Um, some root vegetables. Cress. Maybe. Yeah, watercress and some herbs. I mean, there's some herbs you could grow. Yeah, and sounds like they're currently growing kale, spinach, and parsley. You know, if that's working, I'd keep I'd keep going with it. Yeah, but yeah, Probably leafy. Gonna, uh huh. Yeah, I'd say leafy greens or roots. Yeah, and um, along the same lines of uh, questions, this person's sunlight. Um, Exposure varies greatly by the time of the year. Um, if they place the things in the spot that gets sun all year long, it gets very intense in the summer. Is that okay? And they live in LA. Oh, LA. Um, I don't yeah, know. you'll just have to water more often if it gets really hot, but yeah, you want it in full sun. Yeah, full sun's really what you're after. Yeah. Okay, so with the uh, next question is with the abundance of farmers markets, would you say people are getting more nutrient dense foods or should we just purchase from those vendors that claim to be organic? Um, I would go a step beyond organic and try to buy from regenerative farmers. They're actually um, putting carbon back into their soil and creating a better soil which the better your soil, the more nutrient dense your vegetables will be. Um, there's a lot of organic growers that are still using fertilizer and are not really stewards of the land. Whereas a regenerative farmer is stewarding the land as well. Lisa? Yeah, I mean, I would say that too. I, I wouldn't make myself go crazy over all of it. I mean, if you're eating vegetables first, congratulations, <laughs> you know, good. You've crossed the threshold. Um, and if you're buying from a farmer's market and their local growers, you know, yeah. Is it better to buy? I absolutely probably best is growing your own next best, probably regenerative next best, probably organic next best, probably uh, just your your random farmer at the farmer's market next best grocery store. So, I mean, it's all a matter of, of how much time you've got in your day and all of that. Okay, so next question is, why is it so important to cover cover crop? Most farms don't cover the soil or do they? Um, no, most farms don't cover their soil, but it is a a new movement. It's, it's actually like the oldest way of farming yeah, that farmers are rediscovering because the chemicals killed our soil. The, the chemical fertilizers are loaded with salt and salt kills the life in your soil. And so you kind of set your plants up on this kind of like a sugar addiction cycle, but it's a nitrogen addiction that the the plant, if you're fertilizing it, it doesn't put any of those carbons into the soil because it doesn't need to. So by cover cropping, you're pumping carbon into your soil, you're making your soil a living, living vital thing that will then defend against soil diseases and it'll keep your plant healthy. Does that answer it? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so next question is, um, this person mulches with straw and they're wondering mm -hmm. if they should remove it when getting ready for spring planting or leave it and put a layer of compost over it. Um, I would rake up the straw, put down the compost and put the straw back on top. Yeah, unless the straw is super, super fine, like they've cut it up into teeny tiny pieces, but I'd agree with Kathleen. I'd, I'd remove it, put my compost down and put the straw back as my mulch. Okay, so next question is, is wasting tea and coffee good for soil? Okay, I think they mean, is watering with tea and coffee good for soil or like excess tea and coffee, I guess? 
Anne, what do you think? <laughs> I, you know, I would say not to excess. I mean, if you're throwing out your last sip of coffee for the morning or your, you know, a, a cup of tea here and there, but I wouldn't exclusively use coffee and tea to water my garden. Um, I did do an experiment my freshman year in college and I, the results were not what I thought it would be. I watered a plant with just water and one with just coffee. And I thought the one with coffee would die and it didn't, it did just fine. <laughs> but, um, I, you know, there it's, this is true in life and in gardening. I mean, variety and moderation are the two words you probably need to know. And so you don't want to just do water with coffee and you don't want to just water with tea, but if you're throwing out the last sip of the day, no problem. Yeah. I wouldn't do it intentionally, but it's not going to do any harm. Yeah. Okay. Next question is, what is the difference between a drip open loop and a close loop system? Oh, oh. well, I'm we have, yeah, sorry. The irrigation related? Right. Yeah. yeah. Right. So there's so many times where we go to people's gardens and for whatever reason, we still haven't been able to figure out. And we've asked them like irrigation specialists, but they, they, they take the irrigation line, like Netafim or the half inch tubing or the inline emitters and they make a closed loop instead of a way to take the ends off and flush out your lines uh, there's no way to flush that system and I just don't know why people do it I don't and know it's also really hard when you're adding compost and mulch to pull it up because yeah. it's all one big thing so the closed loop is what we do is at the top of the bed, we run the half inch line. And then off of that line, we run our inline emitters. And at the end of the bed, the inline emitters, emitters stop. And we put a little, either a goof plug or an emitter on the end of it. So you can easily just pull that line up and we can flush it out if we need to. What we see a lot is so you have the, the header line up here, the half inch, and then the inline emitters, but then they take the half inch and they go down the bed and they turn at the bottom and they connect them all. Yeah. And there's no reason to do that. You don't get better water pressure. You, there's just no reason to do it. Yeah. We don't know why people do it. It's a mystery. I can't figure it out. We're still scratching our head over it. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so the next question is, if you planted broccoli in the fall, do you cut it down and replant broccoli? You can. Yeah, you could do a broccoli back broccoli, but kind of that one chart that had the different families, if you have the room and the taste buds, you know, you could back broccoli up with a spinach or a Lettuce. chard. Hmm. Or for that matter, peas. Um, you might want to follow broccoli with a legume. Okay. Uh, do planting times vary greatly in different areas of California? Hmm. It's a good don't question. Know. Yeah, it's a good question. I don't know either. Um, I, I'm not in Santa Clara County, but I'm very close to Santa Clara County. Um, and I use their chart and it works just fine. But we did show that Pam Pierce chart if you're in which, San Francisco. Which the Pam Pierce chart was not that much different than the Santa Clara chart. Yeah, that's true. And that's San Francisco versus let's say San Jose. So I don't know if they're 40 miles apart, maybe, maybe more. Um, but like LA, I wouldn't, I really wouldn't know Southern California, but they have UC Master Gardeners down there. And I bet you anything, they have a planting chart. And I would look at that because I just wouldn't know. You guys have milder winters, uh, hotter summers. Um, so you might plant tomatoes in early March where we'd plant them in late March. It's not going to be wildly different, but it might be different. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. So the next question is um, regarding the same temperature. So cool versus warm temperatures question. Is this regarding when you plant them or that once they are growing, they won't mat? make it if it's warmer than 75 and et cetera. They'll make it, there we go. 
but it'll just be straight. But that's the weather they like to grow in. Um, so brassicas like it cool, tomatoes like it warm. If it gets over 75, your brassicas might go to seed, which they'll they'll put up a seed head and your lettuce definitely will. Um, so they're gonna react to the warm weather and they're probably gonna go to seed. Yeah. So these are essentially the tolerance level of each of the plant, not necessarily the the temperature when you're planting them. Correct. 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 I mean. That being said, they grow a lot of tomatoes in the Central Valley and it gets over 85 all the time in the Central Valley in summer. So they can tolerate it, but yeah, you're gonna have to give them more water. Okay. Alrighty, so uh, this person has a chard that's been producing for about a year now and it's still gro growing pretty strong. Um, is there any reason to cut it down if it seems to be okay or will it harbor like diseases or anything that they're not seeing yet? No, keep if it you, going. The only thing you're going to see on your chard is probably leaf miner and just take those leaves off and eat them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like right now I've got spinach. I've got a lot of leaf miner. I don't actually eat those leaves, but you could. I mean, it's not going to hurt you. You just hold it up to the sun and see if the little worm is still in it. If yeah. not, definitely eat it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. But you can keep things like um, I actually think I think chard might be a biannual anyway, but um, I have a kale that's been growing for two years. Yeah. Some of these things, especially with climate change, you know, things are supposed to be annuals, but now they look like biannuals to us. And, you know, but if it's producing and it tastes good, keep it, keep it in. Yeah. Keep it going. Okay. Okay, so the next question or questions are all related to the floating row cover. So I'll read them all and then you can address them. Um, so what's a floating row cover and what works best for the floating row covers? What is a screen um, that it's made out of? And can we use floating cover for cover crops or something else to be effective? Um, well, I can... Floating row cover is a, it's a, the brand name is Agrabon or one of the brand names is Agrabon. And it is just to keep insects and birds off your plants. You don't leave it on for a long time. Um, you also, when you first seed, you, you wanna put it down because those little baby seedlings are gonna pop up and critters are gonna eat them. Uh, yeah use it on cover crops as far as just until the seeds pop up but i mean it's not a cover crop it's not putting nutrients into your soil right it's just protecting the little plant from a bird coming and eating it okay. and what's it made out of i'm sure it's i'm sure it's a polyester fabric uh, yeah. you can get different if you go on to like am leonard website you can get like it blocks 75% of the light or it blocks 20% of the light. You can get different thicknesses. I have the lightest thickness because I'm just doing it. I'm not using it. People use it as a frost cover too. Let's say you do live in the Dakotas or you live somewhere where you get a frost and you want to extend your season. Um, you can use it as a frost blanket, but I'm just using it to protect it from critters. Okay. Alrighty, so uh, can you use the plants for compost if there are bugs on it like aphids? Oh yeah, oh, yeah. absolutely. Definitely. The, the more stuff that goes into your compost pile, like the greater diversity, the better. And insects, well, you, I know we went off on kangaroos a little bit, but <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can put any organic matter in there. You can put mouse bodies in there. The only thing I wouldn't put in, if I knew my tomatoes had verticillium, I wouldn't yeah. put those in. Yeah. And I don't put field bindweed in mine. Yeah, that's good. Or, you know what, I wouldn't put a weed that has already gone to seed head. If my weed has a seed head on it, I wouldn't. Well, I actually probably would put it in my compost, but probably technically you shouldn't. Yeah. What about like blackberry? Yeah, I wouldn't put blackberry. I wouldn't put poison oak. Um, so there's a few things I wouldn't put in there, but most things I would. What about oleander? Oh, um, oleander. Oleander. 
you know, I don't know enough about it, uh, but I probably wouldn't. Okay. All right. So next question is, does Galen um, work on verticillium or does Galen Chinese broccoli work on verticillium or only flowering broccoli? I don't know if the Davis study was that specific. They talked only about broccoli. I would need to look at the scientific name of broccoli and uh, the scientific name of Chinese broccoli. I think they're different. Yeah, I so, think so too. I think one's brass, Brassica oleracea. I think they're different too. Yeah, so I, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> but you know what? I would Google that. Uh, just Google UC Davis broccoli tomatoes verticillium and it might come up. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the next question is, would neem work on russet mites? It is certified organic and a miticide. Oh. You know, it probably would. The, the problem is the difficulty on getting the underside of the leaves. Um, I went to UC IPM and they recommend just taking the leaves off. So that's what I did. Yeah. And that seemed to work. It, it stopped it. Oh, good. Stopped them. The little mites. Okay. Um, next question is, what's the best paper for making homemade seed tapes? Toilet paper. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably right. Or a paper towel. Yeah, but paper towel is a little thick. Yeah, but if you keep it moist, they pop up through it. Yeah. Okay. And then should oak leaves be left in soil or yes. on soil, I guess? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Oaks love their leaves. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. can you, I think we had this question on a lot of your talks here, but can you recommend a local arborist? <laughs> we always recommend the same one and he's so busy, but ask him for another recommendation. Um, but we, we do recommend um, Kevin Raftery. Um, he's very, very good. The problem is he's also very, very busy. But if you call Kevin, maybe he can recommend uh, somebody else. Or you can go to um, the ISA website, International Society of Arboriculture. And they, you can, they have a a little button find an arborist and just type in your zip code or location and all the certified arborists that that work in that area will pop up and if you're doing fruit trees I would call them and ask them if they know how to prune fruit trees but um, I would recommend an ISA certified arborist because they'll make a good cut yeah Okay. Oh, your puppy, your puppy. Next Next question. Question. Oh yeah, she woke up finally. Yeah. <laughs> Where do you buy 30% vinegar? Um, I actually, nurseries now have it. Oh, they do? Yeah, some of them do. My nursery down here, San Lorenzo has it. Okay. And so does Urban Farmer in San Francisco. Oh. Um, I also get it from Vinegar Direct. Yeah, I got mine from Vinegar Direct and I, you know, I got four gallons at a time. Yeah, but specifically it has to be 30%. I've used 20% and it's not as effective as yeah. 30%. 30%, it just burns them is what it does. Yeah, yeah. I have had people tell me, it, which I have just go buy it like at Costco or something, but I think that's like 2%. It's pretty low. I think it's 5%. And oh, it's 5%. I mean, I found 20% doesn't work. So 5%, I mean, don't even waste your time. Well, I know, although I have had people tell me it works. So, you know, you can play around with it. Yeah. Okay, all righty. Um, we talked about oak leaves, but what about pine needles falling in your garden? Can you leave that as a mulch or can you use that as a mulch or leave it as this? I, I um, this is what I do. I put my pine needles in my driveway where I'm gonna uh, drive my car over them to smush them up to little tiny pieces. And then I put them around my blueberries. 
I put them around everything that loves um, acid, acid loving stuff, just to lower my pH in my soil. And it works like a charm. UC Davis actually just did a study on using that kind of stuff for acid loving plants. And they found it didn't make a difference in pH. Oh, uh, Kathleen. I know, cover crop. Cover crop makes a difference. Do you cover crop with a certain something if you're trying to lower pH? You do um, mostly grasses and some flowering plants. Oh, okay. And I, you can buy a can of California native grasses or Wegmans has California native lawn seed. You can use that for the grass uh -huh. and um, cover crop with that. And just like a box or a can of Renee seeds of flowers and you're good to go. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm still gonna do my method. And what was that seed company uh, that you use um, for the cover crops? Nature Seeds. Nature Seeds. Okay. And I also use Larner Seeds for their natives. I'm, I'm now going to all natives in my cover cropping. Oh, nice. Yeah. Okay, perfect. All right, so next question is, how do you keep away night moths and white butterflies that lay eggs on your green? Oh, the cat, they're probably talking about the cabbage moth. Yep. Yeah, I don't, but what I do is, um, when you see you have little holes in your brassicas, then you know you have cabbage moths and you just go through them and you turn over the leaves and you're gonna see their little teeny green eggs and you just smush their eggs. Or their little green bodies. Yeah, or their little green bodies. Or little green caterpillars. Yeah, you'll have holes in the you'll have holes in the leaves in the middle of the leaf. Yeah, I tell you, know you have them. Yeah. Okay. So do you need do you need to rotate crops if you grow in pots like tomatoes, or should you replace the soil in the pot? It, you know, it, I'm I'm a very lazy and kind of cheap gardener, so. Um, it would depend on how big the pot is. If the pot is bigger than five gallons, I would rotate crops and not replace the soil. If it was a smaller pot, I might replace the soil every once in a while. What do you think, Lisa? Yeah. Um, I know like Cynthia grows a lot of, from um, Love Apple Farm. Farm. Yeah. I think she puts new soil in every year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, no, I think your I, I think your advice is good. I, I, every few years to put some new soil in there. And yeah. and there it's hard to get the soil food web going. I would still add compost, but there you might have to use some organic fertilizer. Yeah. Okay, so we're going back to the oak leaf questions. Um, <laughs> They actually meant the oak leaves on the vegetable garden bed, not on, you know, underneath the oak tree, I guess. Uh, yeah, I'd probably rake them up. They're yeah. Cool. You know, what I, uh, actually, I did this experiment with Terry a long time ago, maybe 10 years ago, but I, I got a whole bunch of oak leaves from people who were like blowing them off of their driveways. And I put them in a big um, chicken wire bin and I just left them uh, for like several years. And I tell you, that became the nicest soil I have ever seen. It just really broke down to, I didn't do anything, nothing. And um, it just broke down to beautiful soil. Um, so, I mean, they're good. They do turn into soil, but if they were in my vegetable bed, well, for one thing, they're kind of pricky, you know, yeah. they, and um, I just seeded today. I um, was making a seeding mix to start some seeds and I had a bunch of oak leaves in there and I did, I just uh, put them through a quarter inch screen that I have, and I took my oak leaves off out of there. Okay. Oh, I see. All right. So I think that pretty much covers most of the question here. I know there are a couple of website uh, recommendations for Ann Leonard's uh, floating row cover. Um, oh, okay. Ann Leonard. Yeah. And I think that's about it. But I'm sure we can send those via email. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, can you mention the cover crop native seed 
recommendation again, please? Um, Nature Seed, Nature's Seeds makes a California native mix and it has like, I don't know, 18 different types of seeds in it. And then Larners up in Bolinas, L-A-R-N-E-R-S is just a little grower and they have some really nice mixes and they also have grasses. Okay, well, thank you. I think that covered most of the Great. And Kevin, question. do you want to go to the resource page? Although you will all be receiving this. But oops. So whatever reason, I'm gonna to have to figure out my whole keynote thing. That always happens to me. Do I have a resource? Okay. So there's the master gardener. Um, yeah, there's the master gardener gardening chart and the Golden Gate and integrated pest management. And then the next slide is if you have questions, if you have questions beyond today, um, I think the next slide, Kathleen, has, um, oh, it doesn't have the hotline. Oh, um, that's the previous slide. Oh, there, sorry. Okay. So if you have questions, that number on your screen right now, you can call that and uh, ask any additional questions you have, or you can email your question in. And there's always a master gardener who will, it might take them a day or two, but they'll get back to you to answer, um, answer questions. And if you don't live in San Mateo County or um, San Mateo County, if you just Google master gardener in whatever county you're in, um, there's a master gardener near you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you everybody for coming. We really appreciate your tuning in. Yeah. And good questions. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks to both of you for doing this. And I'm sure we'll see you again next month. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. Thanks, my favorite everybody. topic. Cover crop. <laughs> <laughs> All, right. All right. Thanks. See everybody later. Bye. Bye-bye.